Hello everyone. In this video, I'll give you an introduction to Geographic Information Systems or GIS software concepts. If you're a GIS software beginner, this video is for you. Put plainly, Geographic Information Systems or GIS is amazing. In this video, I will show you what GIS software is and what it can and cannot do. Topics I will discuss will include spatial data and asset management, data querying and table joining, spatial analysis, GIS programming and application programming interfaces or APIs, spatial modeling, cartography and map production, animation and three-dimensional or 3D spatial data, mobile GIS field data collection, and I'll also talk about some of the limitations of GIS. I'll also give you a demonstration of GIS software to show you what GIS software looks like in practice. Throughout the entire video, I'll use a free and open source software package so you can get started right away using GIS. Links to the software and data sets I use are available in the descriptions below. If you enjoy this video, please hit the like button, share this video, or subscribing to this channel. Okay, let's go learn about what GIS is. Hello, and welcome to this introduction to Geographic Information Systems or GIS software. The learning objectives for this lecture are to understand the parts of the system that comprises GIS software, understand the concept of layers in GIS, identify common GIS functions that include spatial data and asset management, storage formats, imagery, databases, data querying, table joining, spatial analysis, GIS programming and application programming interfaces or APIs, spatial modeling, cartography and map production, animation, three-dimensional geographic information or 3D, and mobile GIS and field data collection. You'll also learn how to understand some of the limitations of GIS. To understand what a GIS is, let's first take a closer look at what the acronym means. Remove the G from GIS and you have IS or an information system. Information systems have been defined as combinations of hardware, software, data, knowledge, and people. Additionally, like any system, which is a whole constructed of parts, a GIS can also be viewed as an amalgam of several parts that create the overall system. I'll next discuss each of these parts further. Let's take a look at each of the parts of GIS. Software that is used for running GIS operations. For example, open source GIS software packages such as QGIS that I will use for demonstration throughout this video. Hardware that is the platform in which software is run and or data is stored. In today's increasingly interconnected world, hardware can range from traditional PCs to smartphones, to massive computing infrastructures for hosting cloud computing resources, to drones for field data collection, like seen in this picture. People that work with GIS in a variety of capacities, such as using GIS to make decisions, like people living in refugee camps. Knowledge, which is perhaps the most abstract part of GIS, but is equally important as the other parts. Knowledge, in the context of this discussion, refers to the variety of training, education, skills, and experiences that are applicable to GIS. For example, by watching this video, you are gaining new knowledge of GIS. Data, which will always be the most important component of a GIS. And finally, the network. The network can be considered the element that connects all the other parts together. For example, the internet that connects people to GIS data websites or connecting GIS software with web-based data services or social networks 
that connect people who use GIS to one another through things like the GIS user communities or even the YouTube community. The core power of GIS is in its ability to organize data into one common geographic view. The key thing that GIS provides to the organization of data geographically is the concept of map layers. This figure shows a selection of real GIS data sets from Manhattan, New York, USA to demonstrate how map layers are combined using GIS for urban planning. First, we might have imagery, which provides a visual reference to the geographic region in question. A census tract layer that shows population thematic characteristics tax parcels as to who owns what buildings, a road layer that provides reference to critical infrastructure, a social media layer, which represents locations of people who are tweeting about issues they might be facing in the city, and a hospitals layer, which provides reference for medical issues. The concept of map layers itself is not a new idea as acetate map overlays existed for years before the advent of computers. What makes modern GIS driven map layer so powerful is the ability to overlay any number of digital map layers together in reference to a common geography, thus allowing for entities on the layers to be viewed and analyzed together with the interactive power that GIS offers, such as quickly changing map layers, symbology of map layers, or any other GIS function that I'll discuss later in this video. GIS software contains many powerful tools that can serve numerous functions. The following parts of this video discuss some important GIS functions. As discussed previously, data is the most important component with the overall system that is GIS. The management of spatial data using GIS is thus a primary GIS function. Management of GIS can come in many forms. For example, GIS is often used to create spatially referenced data. Creation of spatial data can involve many activities, such as digitizing features from images. In this example, features are being digitized from a historic map image. A variety of construction tools, such as points, lines, and polygons, are being used to create features in three categories, roads as lines, houses as points, and water as polygons. Once GIS data is created, or while it is being created, it must be stored in some type of data repository so that it can later be queried, retrieved, disseminated, and updated. Data repositories for GIS data are diverse as GIS data itself. This image shows one of the most basic, yet still commonly used GIS data storage formats, a comma-separated values or CSV file. In this example, Place name features are stored in a CSV file. CSV files are nothing more than an ASCII-based text file where data in the file is structured using commas to define data columns, and each line in the file represents a single data record. Most often used for storing point features, specific geographic information is often represented as decimal degree XY Cartesian coordinate numbers in the file that can then be parsed or read by GIS software for rendering on a map. 
CSV files are a common data storage format used by GIS data providers, such as the U.S. Census Bureau and the United States Geological Survey. Additionally, other characters such as a pipe or a tab can be used to structure text-based data like a CSV file. In this video, you're seeing an example of the specific files that comprise what is known as a shapefile and what the contents of a shapefile look like when displayed in GIS. Using buildings in Mumbai, India as an example, a shapefile is actually a collection of three or more files used for storing what is known as vector GIS data. A shapefile has become a de facto, although not official spatial data standard for many years due to its widespread use in the GIS market and publication of datasets in shapefile format. The shapefile is still a widely used format and many GIS datasets published by entities around the world still use it. That's why it's important to mention. Shapefile data can be viewed only using special GIS software, unlike CSV files, which can be viewed using a basic text file viewing program. Later in this video, when I do a full demonstration of free and open source GIS software, I'll show you more data sets from Mumbai, India that you can download from my website. Imagery, such as satellite or aerial imagery, is commonly used as reference data in GIS. Here you are looking at what is known as bands of imagery or different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that have been stored as separate imagery files. These bands are from what is known as Landsat imagery and are showing a wildfire in California, USA. These separate bands can be combined to create a single image that can display different colors like you see at the end of the video. In the demonstration later in this video, I'll show you how you can manipulate colors in different bands of remote sensing imagery with GIS to understand different aspects of geography using imagery. This figure shows storage of GIS data in a relational database. This is a very broad category of how GIS data is stored and entails keeping geographically referenced information inside structures that normally store other types of non-geographic information. Storage of GIS data inside of relational databases is typically used in large-scale operations where there are massive volumes of GIS data that have complex modeling requirements and need to be shared with many people. Most professional-grade GIS technology offers support for storing GIS data inside of relational databases such as Microsoft SQL Server or open-source GIS enterprise database environments like shown in this figure. GIS is fundamentally driven by data. Querying is the basic idea of asking a question of a data set. Queries are a very common practice in data management in general and are not solely restricted to GIS applications. Understanding how to do queries in a geographic context is perhaps one of the most fundamental skills you can learn as you will then be able to ask questions of your data and get potential answers to help you solve problems, decision-making, and conduct analysis. In this example, you're seeing a basic structured query language or SQL statement where records related to the states of India are being queried inside of a GIS environment. GIS also provides its own set of what are known as spatial query operators that extend traditional SQL approaches to ask questions of data from spatial perspectives. For example, how geographic features spatially relate to one another, such as intersecting, touching, and sharing segments, like seen in this figure. Another important concept from database management that's incorporated into GIS and is a core function of any GIS software is the idea of table joining. The basic idea behind table joining is where two tables have an attribute or join field in common that is used to combine the two tables into one table. In this example, you see a table containing polygons of land types that is being joined with another table that provides descriptions of those land types. 
Analysis refers to the use of GIS to investigate geographically or spatially oriented questions or problems. An important point in this regard too is that GIS software contains methods or tools designed to understand spatial patterns or processes. In this example, you see the results of an analysis that was done on 311 call records related to Hurricane Harvey in Houston, Texas, USA in 2017. In particular, an analytical technique called kernel density estimation was run to create heat maps that identify where the most frequent amount of calls related to the disaster were occurring. GIS programming refers to the use of computer programming languages to build custom software applications or tools to accomplish tasks that out of the box GIS software might not be capable of accomplishing. GIS programming thus evolved to become a more specialized task requiring interdisciplinary computing and information technology knowledge and skills such as computer programming that could be matched with GIS software tasks and principles. GIS programming is still a highly valued skill, knowledge of which, which makes one very valuable in terms of employability. A GIS programmer may write computer code for tasks ranging from batch data processing to automation to the development of modern day mapping mashups that use complex algorithms for integrating heterogeneous data sources to solve unique problems. In this example, an open source web mapping environment called leaflet.js is shown that uses a computer programming language called JavaScript to create interactive web maps. This is a great example of using an application programming interface or API to create a custom web-based GIS application. In this example, you see the underlying JavaScript and HTML code that was used to create the web page previously shown. GIS programming, however, is applicable to a wide range of computing platforms and languages. In this image, you see an example of the Python computer programming language that is used for data analysis and other data automation tasks. Python is a language that is used in both commercial and open source GIS environments. GIS programming is also on the forefront of today's explosion in dealing with massive volumes of data that broadly fall under the label of data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. In this image, you see a screenshot of an open source tool called the Jupyter Notebook that is used for data science applications. Inside of the Jupyter Notebook are a few lines of Python code that are written to a renderer map using the leaflet.js API that you saw previously in this video. GIS is also a very powerful tool for modeling what if scenarios. Much like model trains and cars give us a scaled representation of a real world entity, modeling in the context of GIS is the idea of using GIS to simulate conditions in the real world. For example, a GIS based model could be developed to simulate possible storm surge conditions and outcome scenarios, like seen in this figure. Another very powerful use of GIS modeling techniques is the modeling of transportation networks and scenarios related to logistics and transportation planning. In this image, you see the results of a transportation modeling analysis that is examining where electronic debris originating from disaster spots can be transported to recycling facilities within a certain distance of what are known as service areas. Of course, one of the most basic functions that modern GIS software provides is the ability to visualize geographic and make maps using the time-honored traditions of cartography. This example shows the production of a final Mac product designed to communicate the results of a natural disaster resilience model in Rwanda. Modern GIS tools offer a powerful suite of cartographic tools for making digital maps that offer endless opportunities for engaging in the art and science of cartography.
Time and animation have long been a mainstay of GIS software. In particular, animation is useful, when done correctly, to show dynamic processes, such as change that occurs over space and time. In this example, a map has been animated to show the change in population of India from 1960 until 2018. Note the use of different colors to show how the population increases. The inclusion of time with space can offer a fundamentally different way of thinking about how the analysis of geography, as well as different forms of visual representation, can go beyond traditional static maps. Once reserved for very specialized software, three-dimensional representations of geographic information are now mainstream in GIS software. The combination of three-dimensional representations combined with animation techniques such as fly-throughs make for compelling visualizations that can realistically show geography in new and exciting ways. Given that GIS is fundamentally focused on mapping and representing where things are located in the real world, field data collection via mobile GIS platforms is critical to geographic data collection and maintenance. In this image, a student of mine is mapping a refugee camp in Rwanda using a common smartphone with a lightweight field mapping application that's easy to use and can collect a wide variety of geographic information in the field. Free and open source GIS tools like Open Data Kit or ODK Collect have become powerful technologies that allow for collecting and maintaining geographic data using a wide variety of platforms such as tablet computers, smartphones, and field computers. Of course, one of the most exciting developments in recent years for field data collection of geographic information is the advent of drones. In this example, you see a drone that is being used to collect geographic information about water temperature conditions as part of an environmental monitoring process. The geographic information collected with this drone will be analyzed using GIS software. Finally, it's important to consider the limitations of GIS. Technology in general is often seen as a miracle cure for existing problems, but it's important to manage the expectations about what GIS can do. The following are some points to keep in mind in terms of the limitations of GIS. GIS software is not a miracle technology that can automatically answer all questions. Although this may seem obvious, it is important to keep in mind that GIS is limited by the numerous components of the system that comprises GIS as discussed previously. For example, the answers you get are only as good as the software used, the quality of the data used in the software, the skills of the people operating the software, conducting the analysis, or doing the modeling and producing the final maps. GIS can strongly support answering questions, but it is still human reasoning and critical thinking that must make final decisions. Over-reliance and over-expectation of the technology coupled with a lack of proper GIS education and training and lack of good human judgment, reasoning, and critical thinking can all lead to dire consequences. The acquisition, creation, editing, and curation of data is the most costly aspect of GIS. Anyone who's experienced with GIS has most likely learned this lesson the hard way. If you're new to GIS, it is very important to understand the importance of data for being successful at utilizing GIS technology. GIS operations, analysis, modeling, and cartography are fundamentally data-driven. Acquiring GIS-ready data is costly, both in terms of hours spent collecting and editing data, or perhaps spending money on purchasing GIS data from a data vendor. In my own teaching experiences, I've seen many great student research project ideas fail or have to undergo major modifications due to a lack of data to support the investigation. Thus, 
If you're new to GIS, pay very close attention to how you will find data that can support your investigation and how much time and possibly money you're willing to spend to acquire data. In this next part of the video, I'll tie together many of the concepts you saw in the previous parts of this video, doing a full demonstration of a free and open source GIS software package called QGIS. I'll use Mumbai, India as a case study for exploring some GIS data sets. These data sets are available for you to use and can be downloaded using the link below in the video description. Hello everyone. Welcome to the demonstration part of the video. What you're seeing here is the QGIS free and open source geographic information systems or GIS environment. This is a very popular tool used around the world. And like I said, it's free and open source. That means that you can download the program and use it for no charge. And right now I don't have any data inside of QGIS. So I first want to show you how you would add a base map. And I'm going to do that by clicking this button here. And this will give me the OpenStreetMap OSM, and I'm going to choose OSM standard. If you've never heard of OpenStreetMap, it's also one of the world's most popular free and open source data sources that are used in a lot of different projects and so forth. So if you're looking for data for your GIS research project, keep OpenStreetMap in mind as they have the whole entire world covered and they're very much in the spirit of free and open source data and they have a lot of integration with QGIS. And I should mention that the way I was able to add OpenStreetMap into QGIS was using a plugin. This is the Quick Map Services plugin. And if you wanna see what other plugins are in QGIS, you go to this menu, Manage and Install Plugins, and you can see I have a couple of them installed, the popular grass for raster, analysis and so forth. However, you'll also see under not installed, there's tons of them. And the reason I mention this is that QGIS is a very powerful software on its own. However, sometimes you may find it doesn't do things that you need. So take a look at the vast world of plugins that exist for the software as that's one of the benefits of being a free and open source software. It has a very rich community of people that want to develop new plugins and software pieces for the software environment. So with OpenStreetMap added to the map, let's just go over some of the basics of using the software. Panning the map is this button here. It allows me to move around. This is my zoom. I'm gonna hold my left button down in Windows and drag a box and release it. And that'll zoom me in and so forth. And I'll show you some other the very basic tools in just a minute. I should also mention that I'm using one particular version of QGIS. So depending on when you're watching this video, make sure that you have the newest version or perhaps just make adjustments between what you're seeing in this video for me and what your software environment does. All right, let's next go over the Mumbai India data sets that I've provided for you on my website. And if I go over to my Windows Explorer directory, you can see that I've downloaded the data sets and they're gonna to come to you as a zip file. And just to make sure everyone's clear on how to work with them, once you download the zip file onto your computer, I've put mine in an easy directory, ctemp. I'm gonna use an unzipping tool. I like to use 7-zip. So I'm gonna right click, 7-zip, extract to Mumbai data sets and create a new folder. And if you take a look at what's inside of that folder, you'll see a lot of shape files that were talked about earlier in this video. As one example, these are all one shape file. You can, as I said earlier, a shape file is a series of three or more files. And I use shape files for this demonstration as they're widely available, easy to use, and they'll fit in a lot of different software environments. As I will have other videos using commercial GIS software that I'll also utilize with these data sets. I've also included what's called a geo TIFF file that I'll talk about in a moment. And that's some imagery of Mumbai from the Landsat 8 collection. And I've also included a text file of place names that we'll also talk about. Now this is behind the scenes in Windows Explorer. QGIS, however, has tools for adding these data sets right into your map. And to access that tool, I'm gonna to go to this menu, Layer, Data Source Manager. 
And you can think of this as kind of like your Windows Explorer, but for GIS data sets. And as you can see here, I have my file system and QGIS is very powerful in the numerous types of data formats that it can bring into its environment. I didn't even get close to talking about most of these in my earlier video. I did show you a screenshot actually of post GIS and so forth, but there's a lot of possibilities out there, but I'm going to use the file system. I'm going to go to C temp and here's my folder here that I just unzipped. And if I expand that out, I can see now representations of all my data sets as what are called vectors and some rasters. And this can be a little confusing if you're new to GIS and so forth. Now let's just add some of these in to see what they look like. Let's start first with just a polygon that represents the boundary of the city of Mumbai. So I'm going to click on that SHP or shapefile and do add layer to project. And when I do that, if I go back over to my map, and then I zoom in. On Mumbai. You can see this polygon now that's an outline of the city of Mumbai. Now notice right now it's sort of an orange colored fill. So let me show you one of the really basic things that any GIS tool can do, which is changing what's called the symbology or display of a given data layer. So on Mumbai boundary polygon, I'm going to right click, go to properties, and I'm going to look for the symbology. And from the fill, I'm using a single symbol and I'll show differences in that in just a minute. Single symbol. I'm going to make the fill color transparent. And I'll make the outline, oh, I don't know, I'll make it red. So when I do that, now you can see this red line that's now transparent as I can see the open street map base map behind it. If I wanted to, I could also make that red line a little thicker. So it's more visible. See how it got thicker. Now I'll repeat that process for some of my other data sets I have. So again, I'm going to go to the data source manager under my C temp and I'll add these other ones in. I'll add buildings, land use, natural areas, places of worship, railroads and roads. And I use the control key to make a multiple selection, a very standard windows operation. And I'll add all those layers into my map. And as you can see right away, the map gets a little busy with a lot of things, but that's good because this is a very diverse group of data sets. And this is where I encourage you to start exploring what's in here. So if I zoom in a little closer, you might remember this even from the demonstration of shape files in general I did earlier in the video, the buildings in Mumbai. Now, another really common task that you can do in any GIS software is toggling of the layer visibility. And all I have to do for that is a ch the checkbox. So if I were to go and uncheck Mumbai buildings, notice how all of those brown polygons kind of disappeared and I'm seeing the underlying open street map behind it. And by the way, all of this data that I'm using comes from open street map. And they're in a form of what's called vector GIS data. And I have separate videos on that topic of what's called raster, which are pixels or continuous surfaces of data or vector, which are points, lines, and polygons. So you can see that clearly here that these are basically the same data. The OSM base map is basically an image or a raster and all this other data was extracted out of it as a vector. Now let's take a look at some other things you can do with symbology. Let's take a look at the land use. I can right click and do zoom to layer to kind of get an overview of what I'm looking at here. And I see a lot of different kinds of land use. These they're currently green polygons on top of the map. Now let's look at another part of GIS that's essential. It's called the attribute table. And with this tool here, the identify, when I click on one of those polygons, one of these green polygons, I can find out 
things about what is in that polygon. And that's the idea of the attribute table. So every polygon, which in this example represents a land use, has things called attributes or values tied with it. And in this case, there's a value called the F class or feature class, and that's a meaning that's a recreational ground. And if I continue with that idea, the one I just clicked on that's now red is a cemetery. That one is industrial and so forth. Now let's say I wanna change my display so that all of those land use polygons are displaying based on the value of the F class or feature class. And that's a really powerful aspect of GIS is incorporating basic, you might call it qualitative cartographic representations. So in order to do that, I'm gonna go over to Mumbai land use, right click on it, go to properties. And this time, instead of a single symbol, I'm gonna go up here to categorized. And the column I'm gonna pick is the F class. And then I'm gonna click the classify button. And what I'm gonna get are all of the unique values that are found in the underlying attribute table of this particular data layer, cemetery, commercial, farm, and so forth. When I hit apply, notice now how my map has changed and if I expand this out, I now have sort of a pseudo legend going, showing what all the different land uses in Mumbai from the Mumbai land use layer are looking like. And if I hit the zoom out button, I can kind of see this a little bit more clearly. Now that we've seen how you can change the symbology of a data layer based on attribute values, let's take a closer look at the attribute table itself and show you some of the basic ideas of querying that were discussed earlier in the video. If I were to go to the Mumbai land use layer and right click on it and select open attribute table, I see the underlying table with all the records in the layer. Now, if I wanted to do a basic query, let's say for example, I wanna find all of the land use values that are industrial. Perhaps I'm doing an environmental analysis of the city of Mumbai. If I click on this button, select features using an expression, it brings up a dialog box similar to creating a where clause in an SQL statement if you're a technical person, or basically just asking what particular attribute you wanna find. Now, the way you're gonna do this is, I'm gonna look for a value where F class is equal to industrial. So I'll have to type that in. So if I start typing the letter F, C, you can see it tries to help me out by filling in the name of the field or the column. So I'm going to do F class is equal to, and then I have to do, because what's called a string, a particular data type, as opposed to a number, I'll put a single quote and I'll type in the word industrial. Okay, now watch when I hit select features. If I type this incorrectly, we should see some of these records over here get highlighted. And they did. So with my expression, that's a basic example of a query. I want only the records in this layer where the F class column is equal to the value of industrial. I close this. You can see up here, I've selected 114 records and they're currently highlighted in yellow in my map to show which ones are the selected records. Next, let's take a look at what's called a raster data set. And I'm gonna add that to my map back using layer data source manager. And that's what this MLND SAT8, that stands for Mumbai Landsat 8. And I went and got this data set for you from the U.S. Geological Survey as all of their data is in the public domain. And I cropped down specifically a Landsat scene on Mumbai. And I just want to show you in general imagery, but also some interesting things like I mentioned before about how you can manipulate the colors in the Landsat imagery. So if I right click on this layer, and I'll do add layer to project. Notice too how it put it sort of in the middle. Another really basic thing about layers inside of GIS software is the order of drawing. So I need to actually move this to the bottom of my list of layers. So see how my red outline from before now is 
drawing on top of it. And if I were to turn the land use layers back on and so forth. Now, something to mention briefly about raster or imagery is the spatial resolution. If I were to zoom in, I'm using my um, mouse wheel to zoom in now. Notice how it's all pixelated. And you're not going to get the level of detail like you do with the open street map. And that's just the reality that comes with Landsat data. It's not designed to look at individual buildings. However, it is good for looking at sort of the bigger picture of an area that you're interested in. So let's say I'm doing an environmental investigation of the entire city. I'm interested in perhaps how the water quality, land use patterns, and so forth. And that's where Landsat is good. It's often used for broader, larger areas of analysis, looking at, say, um, the rainforest or climate change in the, in the Arctic and so forth. Now, an interesting thing, like I mentioned before, about imagery, depending on the kind you have, is how you can change the colors. So if I were to right-click and go to Properties, notice for this image I have options for the different bands. And I mentioned bands earlier in the video. Bands are the idea of basically segments of electromagnetic energy that are captured by a remote sensing sensor. And Landsat 8 has a whole variety of different bands that it captures, and you can manipulate those in the red, green, and blue color channels. So this particular Landsat product is what's called surface reflectance. So if I were to put in the red channel band 4, in the green channel band 3, and in the blue channel band 2, and then hit apply, notice how the color of the image changed. And this is much more what's called the more natural color view. Now, just to show you some other variations on this idea. If I were to put in the red channel band five, in the green band, green channel band four, and in the blue channel band three, you get what's called the color infrared image. Now notice by just changing which band is displayed in which color channel, I can see differences. And this is a kind of representation you would use for looking at vegetation. Now I honestly am not familiar with the city of Mumbai, I've never been there, but I can just tell by looking at it, you have a very strong urban core area, and then areas in red are vegetation, and it looks like in this part of the city, you have a lot of vegetation that's somewhat healthy as the more red the color, the more healthy the vegetation in question. And I can kind of even look at that. I can just see even through the open street map, we have some forested areas and so forth. And you kind of see that in the Landsat image. Some other tools that are common to GIS would be a measuring tool. So for example, if I wanted to understand maybe how much vegetation was here, I would click here, measure area, and I can use my mouse to drag a polygon around. And you can see how my numbers, about 200, 450 square meters of area and so forth. That's also very common and a useful tool you can use for your spatial analysis. Okay, next I wanna show you about using text files in GIS, as these are very common file formats that are used to share and represent geographic information. If I go back to the Mumbai data sets and I take a look at this file that I've given you called Mumbai place names, and I were to open up in a text editor, basically what these are are a collection of points that represent places within Mumbai. Now a key thing here is to look, it's a little hard to read it just on its own, but what this file has are latitude and longitude coordinates that are stored inside of the file itself. And what we're gonna do is use those coordinates to represent place names from Mumbai as points in the map. And so to do that, I'm gonna go back over here to the data source manager. And I'm gonna go this time under where it says delimited text. And I'm gonna go find that file and here it's still in memory, Mumbai place names. I'm gonna open it up. If it doesn't prompt you, you have to pick what's called a coordinate reference system or CRS. 
Now, I would suggest WGS84. If when you're working with this data, it doesn't turn out the way. And then I hit add. I'll close that. And if I right click and zoom to this layer, I'll turn off the image. You can see a whole bunch of points that are now on the map that represent place names. All right, now that you've got the place names added to the map, let's take a closer look at the attribute table of the place names to see what you can do with this new layer. If I were to right click, open attribute table, and if I take a look at some of these columns, make note of these two, the feature class and the feature code, feature CL class and feature CL code. And with those, I can then create some interesting point representations based on what this place name point represents. So the feature class is gonna be a letter. In this case, I'll look at this record right here, number three. It's an S with a feature code of HTL. Now, if I go to the GeoNames documentation page, you'll see that you have all kinds of documentation on what all those various codes mean. So what you first start with is the letter, the feature code. So I'm going to go to S. So anything that has a feature code of S is a spot building or a farm. And then if I scroll within the S, and HTL stands for hotels and tells you about what it is. So place name points can be really interesting if you're trying to make a map that shows different features in a given area of interest. Now, if I go back over to my table, in some sense, this one was kind of easy because it's the ambassador. Maybe if you're from Mumbai, you know that that's a hotel and so forth. Um, but take a look at some of those codes because they can be interesting because what you can do then is similar to like what I showed you before, you can right click, go to properties, do categorized, and whoop, not the feature class, we want the feature code. And then it takes a lot of work, but what you can then do for HTL, you can change that to say hotel. And perhaps change the symbol around and so forth. This is just a quick example I'm showing you just to show you what's possible. A lot of hotels around and so forth. I hope you found this demonstration useful. Of course, there's way more to this software and other GIS software packages than what I've shown in this relatively brief demonstration. However, with these data sets and the few things I've showed you, plus links to free and open source software, you should be able to get started and on your way with learning about geographic information systems or GIS. In this video, you are given an introduction to geographic information systems or GIS software. You should now understand the individual components of the system that comprises GIS. You should also understand the concept of map layers, which is used to reference various GIS datasets to one another using common geography. Next, you were shown the various functions that GIS can do, such as data and spatial asset management, which is at the core of any GIS, data querying, table joins, and analysis to help answer questions and derive insight into spatial problems, programming for developing custom applications and tools to extend the capabilities of GIS with application programming interfaces or APIs, modeling for creating scaled representations of reality and to answer what if questions, cartography and map production, which connects modern day GIS with the millennia old practice of map making and representation of geographic features, animation in 3D, which can help to make compelling narratives of geographic information in space and time, like the time map example you saw. And finally, mobile GIS for field data collection using technologies ranging from smartphones to drones. You also learned a little bit about what GIS cannot do, 
points important to keep in mind as you learn more about GIS and need to manage technology expectations. Finally, you were shown a demonstration of a free and open source GIS software package called QGIS. The following are references used in preparing this video. Thanks for watching this video. I hope now that you have a good understanding of what's possible in the exciting world of Geographic Information Systems, or GIS. As a reminder, all of the software examples given in this video are free and open source. Check out the link below in the description to find out how you can access these tools to get started right away with learning about GIS. And as one final comment, this is just the beginning. Please subscribe to this channel to keep updated on new videos, share this video, and hit the like button if you enjoyed this video, and provide any comments or feedback or questions you may have. Thanks for watching.